Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thanks also to the organizers for putting together such a nice conference. Uh, yes, I'm going to tell you uh, a tale. Uh, the first part of a chronicle about the adventures and misfortunes that I had the pleasure of sharing with this, uh, oh, wait, this nice group of adventures, which is now disappearing. Is this like laser? Ah. This nice group of, uh, of people over the course of a two year long voyage throughout the lands of Tubordia. So what is Tubordia? Tubordia is a magical realm like you know, Narnia or Middle Earth, uh, uh, which is inhabited uh, instead of by elves and dwarves, it's inhabited by the cobordism classes of type 2b supergravity. And not only the cobordism classes of type 2b supergravity in, uh, in Tubordia, you can also find uh, the brains and defects that trivialize these cobordism classes. So this is a map. Uh, of the lands of Tuborde, which was done by Paco Giudici. You can find a better resolution version in our paper. Uh, it was a lot of fun to, to, to do. Uh, so as you can see in the map, there's two main routes leading to the lands of Tuborde. You could take the path of the mathematician, uh, which takes you through the mathematical skills, essentially spectral sequences, uh, which were also featured in Jake's talk yesterday, the Adam spectral sequence and the Asia Hirtebrook spectral sequence that are necessary to compute the coordinates groups that lead to Bordia. And there's a whole story there, but the path that we will take in this talk is the path of the physicist, which uses these coordinates groups to predict new objects, new brains uh, in, uh, in type 2b string theory. So you basically take the results of the first path for granted. And there's also a little path here, which we put in the paper, which is the path of the BC professor, you cannot read, that takes you directly to the bond of conclusions. Uh, but we'll, so today in, in both this talk and the one after the break by Marcus, we will be covering uh, our trip towards this path, uh, through this path. And uh, I will mostly be talking about a new non-supersymmetric brain that we found, which we call the, well, not so new, actually, uh, the, the reflection seven brain and some comments on discrete data angles in time to be string theory. Uh, sorry? <laughs> it, 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 they actually so they, they run parallel to each other so you need to go through the wilderness but you can go from one to the other we have to do that a lot <laughs> yeah okay so this was like the fantasy version of it like just in case i tried to make it funny and understandable but in case it wasn't clear like the point of this talk is we have completed certain coordinates and groups of type to be super gravity and the, the gist that we introduced is that we took into account the type 2b duality group, the duality bundle. Uh, so we included duality twists in computing these coordination classes, which significantly complicates the calculation. Uh, and then we basically, you know, following the, the perspective that, uh, that Jake and Cobram put together in, in, uh, in their coordination paper, we interpret these groups as leading to global symmetries, which we don't believe exist in quantum gravity. And then we need to introduce some brains, just like in Jake's talk, uh, that kill these global symmetries. And we actually, by following this perspective, we are able to recover some supersymmetric brains, some of the brains that we know and love, and also some new interesting features. So what is the plan of the talk? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll start with a brief, brief review of coverage and conjecture. This was done by Jake already yesterday. I'll basically be repeating the stuff in case you forgot. Then I will particularize this to coordinates and groups of type 2b, use them to predict new brains, and then I will give you some conclusions. Okay? Very good. So the way I understand it, the coordinates in conjecture is essentially a spin off of the idea there's no global, symmetries in, no, no global symmetries in quantum gravity, combined with the observation, interesting observation, that if you have non trivial topology, that in itself can sometimes lead to new charges. So, this is, a, this is a very nice example. I think it's actually taken from Jake and Kumbrun's paper. Imagine, just to be very concrete, imagine your favorite five-dimensional theory of gravity. Maybe same theory on your favorite Calabi-Yau, uh, or maybe you just believe that pure 5D gravity exists, and then you can take that one. And think of a 
constant time slice in this theory. So the constant time slices look like R4, right? So on this R4, I'm going to do something funky. I am going to go and take a K3 manifold and glue it. Just going to glue it with a tube. And so what is the effect of this? Well, from a point of view of an observer, which is sitting here, this is like a localized defect, localized object, kind of like a solitonic particle, which is just floating there. Um, and if you think about it, there are certain quantities, like for instance, the, the whole homology lattice of K3 is still preserved and it's preserved on the small deformations. If you change the metric a little bit, you're not gonna change the intersections of the K3. So in a sense, this looks like I attach by gluing the K3, I put in some particle, which has some conserved charge, which is just, you know, the homology of K3. Uh, and if I were to do this instead of K3, I do it with uh, S2 cross S2 or your favorite form manifold, it looks like I'm gonna get many different particles, many different charges. Uh, it looks like I'm gonna get a lot of conserved charges. But one must remember, if you wanna go down this road, you must remember that the same thing that allowed you to put this guy in the first place, the idea that there's topology change in quantum gravity, also means that the only things that are gonna be conserved are things that are invariant under topology change. So I could imagine a process where this, what M1 here is maybe my K3, and in Euclidean quantum gravity, this K3, you know, grows holes, they reattach, and they do funny stuff. So by the end of it, so you can think of it as Euclidean time, and by the end of it, my manifold looks like a completely different manifold. If, if I think the topology change is allowed in quantum gravity, things like this can happen. So, uh, what that means is that any conserved charge that I want to get out of non-trivial topology has to be a charge which is invariant uh, under this kind of topological fluctuations. And this kind of picture, something that mathematicians have studied, is called a cobordism. Okay? So basically, a cobordism here is this, the, the interpolating manifold. Basically, a cobordism between M1 and M2 is a manifold C such that M1 with M2 together, they form the boundary of C. Okay? So any topological charge you want to create like this has to be uh, and uh, has to be uh, in a sense has to be invariant under cover distance. That, well, that's what it means that it's invariant under topology change in transitions. And it turns out mathematicians have studied this, and this set of classes actually has a nice group group law structure forms a group. It's called the cover distance group. And so the natural notion that you get in effective field theory coupled to topology change in quantum gravity is cover distance group. So for instance. The four-dimensional cobordism group uh, is Z is generated by this K3 particle. So what that means is that this K3 particle that I was giving you before actually can never be, you can make it grow additional cycles and stuff, but you cannot get rid of it by doing this uh, topology change in transitions. You, can, you cannot get completely get rid of it. So the, this is what, this is why the cobordism groups are important. They capture the, the global symmetries that cannot be captured by the smooth topology change transitions in the effective field theory. But we believe there's no global symmetries in quantum gravity. And if we believe there's no global symmetries in quantum gravity, also this K3 guy, somehow, we must be able to make it disappear to show, exhibit that it's as a boundary of some other thing. Because mathematicians have proven, that's what the, the cooperation group means, they have proven that the K3 cannot be the boundary of any five-dimensional manifold, whatever defect that I, wa I want to claim makes sense in quantum gravity I can put here that has K3 as a boundary has to be something uh, very singular. And if I have defects for all of this, I kill all global symmetries by saying that the coordination group of quantum gravity is trivial. That's the, of the, uh, the, the, that's the content of the coordination conjecture of Kuhnman and Jake. And from our point of view here, and also from Jake's point of view yesterday, the interesting thing here is that killing the global symmetry forces introduction of defects, and these defects can be interesting objects in their theory. Uh, there's just one more technical caveat is, you know, you're sometimes interested in effective field theories which have additional stuff. Maybe you have fermions, then you want all these manifolds to have a spin structure. If you have fluxes or gauge bundles, you want to have you know, bundles, uh, you, you want to have them on M1, M2, and they need to extend to C. All of these can be incorporated in the cobordism perspective. They change the cobordism groups. So depending, you know, if you have a U1 bundle, you take into account the 
uh, magnetic flux through cycles. That changes a bit the coordination group calculation, but it's fine. Uh, you can take it into account. And so what we did, and I'm going to tell you what we did, we, in the context of this, uh, of this way of thinking, we computed what you might call the coordination groups of type 2 B string theory with a duality bundle. So what do I mean by that? Well, to tell you what I mean by that, I first need to review a little bit what is the duality symmetry of type 2 B string theory, because it's, it's a bit more complicated than, uh, than when it seems at first sight. So the story of duality of type 2B starts when you observe that just type 2B supergravity has an SL2R global symmetry, the Lagrangian has an SL2R symmetry, that you know uh, it's, it's there on the nose. And when you go to 2B to, to string theory, this is broken to, you typically say it's broken to SL2C uh, by quantum effects, uh, the quantized, direct quantization condition of brains and stuff. Uh, this SL2C actually has a very nice interpretation the useful story goes, as the mapping class group of the F-theory torus. And during, if you do M to F duality, this is just the group of diffeomorphisms of the physical M-theory torus. But once you start thinking about this picture, you realize it has to be a little bit more because, you know, first of all, type 2B and M-theory are theories which have fermions. And, you know, this SL2C does things like if you have the torus, you know, you can, you, you flip it or you rotate it by 90 degrees. Stuff like that on bosons, when you do it, you know, four times, for instance, it squares, it goes to minus one. So it, uh, it goes to the identity, but when you have fermions, it acts as minus one. So you need to enlarge this group by extending it via an untrivial mixing with fermion number. And it becomes some other group, which is called the metaplectic group. But furthermore, in the M-theory picture, we know that M-theory actually makes sense under reflections. You can flip one of the two coordinates of the torus. And what that means is that you also need to include reflections of the F-theory torus, so to say, they are perturbative symmetries of type 2B. They're called minus 1 to the FL and omega. These are familiar from orientable constructions. So you also need to include those. And when you combine everything, combine the fact that you need to have a lift to fermions and you also have reflections, the actual duality group you end up with is this weird thing, which is the PIM plus cover of GL2C. It's a complicated, relatively complicated guy, but that's the guy you get. Okay. So what did we do? We consider manifolds which have a bundle of this guy, bundle with this group, which interplays in the proper way with fermions. We took care of that. And actually what we did, we computed the three approximations I just described to cover different groups in F theory or in type 2B supergravity uh, with duality bundle. So we computed, for, if, you, if you imagine you have just an SL2C bundle, we computed those. Then we went to the next step and said, okay, we are gonna allow, we're gonna take into account the fermions, but we are still not allowing you to do reflections just because it's simpler. We computed those as well. And finally, we did the whole thing, uh, taking into account also the reflections of the F theory torus. And that's, you know, then you, the, with this quest, you go into the path of the mathematician. It's a whole other story, but this is the result. Uh, these are all the covertism groups. You see there's a lot of them that are not vanishing, really a lot. And what that means is that there's many, many, many potential global symmetries. So of course our work now is go class by class somehow and identify the defects that kill these global symmetries. I am going to focus on the, uh, on the easiest case, which is the first dimensional coordination groups. And I'm gonna leave the complicated ones for Marcus. There's, I'm gonna look actually at two, the easiest one and this other one, omega 10, which classifies theta angles in type to be supergravity, which is also quite easy. Um, okay, let's get going. So if you take the first line, the three coordination groups are this thing, okay? This one really, it's like, a, the, the second one is like a refinement of the first one taking into account fermions. So really they contain more or less the same information. Uh, so that's, so, so, but, but in any case, in all three examples, you know, we are looking at manifolds, one dimensional manifolds with SL2C or spin, spin MP bundles. So, this is easy because there's just essentially one compact closed one dimensional manifold, that's the circle. So the only thing that you need to do is, the only thing you can do really when constructing manifolds which represent 
the generators of these classes of the coordination group is you know to have to, to put a circle with the duality corresponding duality bundle. And then the only thing that the coordination conjecture is telling you is that there has to be some object that allows you to trivialize this class. Because this is real core dimension one, the defect that you get is real core dimension two, it's a seven brain. So the coordination conjecture is telling you something you guys already knew, which is that in type 2b, you have seven brains. And in fact, these two groups, they capture precisely the ordinary seven brains of type 2b supergravity. So the generator of this T3 factor is actually obtained by a circle with a holonomy of the U generator of SL2C, which is of course killed by a collider singularity of type four star. And the C8 is actually generated by a circle with holonomy of type S, uh, can kill with a D4 singularity, okay? And because S and U, you know, they generate the full SL2C, what that means is that we actually get all seven brains. Do you want me to get any other seven brain? I can just start like going around each other with these two guys and I can get whatever. So first thing that the coordinate conjecture does in this setup is recovering the seven brains, which is good. But as I told you, this is spin and P story. It was just like a kind of like a, we're, we're ignoring this perturbative symmetry of type to B. It's not the true duality coordinate group. This is the thing which is the real deal. And you'll notice a very important, and to us at the beginning, very confusing difference between these two guys. I told you this is like the U, you know, generator of the this collider type three and type four is so nice, but there's nothing like that here. It's a completely different coordination group. So what happened? What's going on? I told you I got the seven brains and then I lost them. Well, the answer, which is very interesting, you can also find in a different paper of Jake, uh, is that F theory, like that the, 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 in a sense, the, the PQ7 brains, at, at, at least as far as their monodromy is concerned, they are not fundamental objects in fact to be supergravity. Using these reflections, you can actually construct smooth, very non-supersymmetric, horribly non-supersymmetric configurations, which have the same holonomy, but which are completely smooth. They have no singularity. A seven brain is singular at its core. And the construction in Jake's paper is very, very nice. It's actually general construction. If you have any non-abelian group, this is the circle I was drawing before, and this is where the seven brain would have been. And so what we are doing, we are replacing the seven brain by a torus, which we are gluing by connected sum. And on the torus, we are putting monodon, we are putting different holonomies of whatever generators you want of your duality group. And then you can check that once you do this construction, the holonomy that you get here is the commutator of whatever you put here. And here's a fact. S and U are not commutators in spin and P, but they are commutators in spin GL plus 2Z. So what that means is that by choosing A and choosing A and B adequately, you can engineer guys which are non-supersymmetric, but they look like seven brains. They, they look like they have the same holonomy, the same physical charge, as a seven brain. And this construction actually does something which is a bit off topic, but it's neat. It allows us to give a slightly different perspective on a problem which was left open in the paper by Kuhnman and Jake. One of the classes where they were not able to find the cover distance defect is the class of F theory in K3. So this is a, this is a picture of F theory in K3 in a part of moduli space, which is called sense limit, where this is essentially type 2B it's like type to be on T2 mod Z2. So this torus that you see here is T2 mod Z2 and has four fixed points. And on those four fixed points, you have O7 minuses plus, uh, plus D7s, okay? Each of these corners looks locally like a seven brain, you know, in flat space, like the setup I was describing before. And in fact, the allonomies that you get here are commutators in spin plus C. So as far as holonomies are concerned, I'm playing here a, a game, uh, uh, you know, similar to to you know to uh, to, to Lara's talk uh, this morning. I'm just changing one thing for another, which has the same charges. As far as holonomies are concerned, I could replace these guys by this little tor I was drawing with appropriate holonomies. And then, if you go back to my previous slide where I gave you the cohort distance groups of type two b, the second 
uh, toward, uh, I should have put the GL here, but the relevant guy is actually zero, which means that this whole thing, I can now find a boundary for it. Now, we, the, why are we not claiming that we got it? This is the boundary. Well, because this transition, right, between the 07 minus plus the 87s, we cannot really prove this is the same as this. The only physical charge that we could identify, which is the holonomy, matches. But what do we know? Maybe there's something else. Maybe there's something we, we're not seeing. Stuff like that happens, and you can ask me about it later if you're interested. Anyway, this is an interesting upshot, and we understand now what is the relationship between the coverage that I gave you before and how to get the seven brains. Uh, but uh, you still have these two coordinates in classes here you haven't trivialized. What are you going to do with it? Well, these are classes where you do the FDR torus and you just reflect it. You know, as you go around the circle, you just glue it back with a reflection. So what the coordination conjecture tells us is that we need to invent a new seven brain. In this case, it's non-supersymmetric, which, uh, which kills this class. We are calling them reflection seven brains. They are non-supersymmetric. Uh, and yesterday, talking to Jack, uh, I, uh, we learned that they actually are already described in this paper. Like they have a bunch of, uh, of, of, of a, a list of predictions in the end of the paper where they predict things like the domain will be in type 2 and type 2b. And they also have this guy. Uh, so we should call it D7 brain. Um, that would be confusing. Anyway, so we studied this guy. Uh, and it's a very interesting guy. And it provides us a non supersymmetric check of the coalition conjecture because we, you will now see that some things that could have gone wrong actually come out right. I think that's interesting. So, first of all, uh, this brain is strongly coupled at its, at its core. You can just look what is the boundary condition that it provides for type 2b supergravity fields. And it's not something you can do in perturbation theory. So it has to be strongly coupled. We essentially, when we, we check all possible orbifolds, none of them work. You cannot construct it as a worsted orbital, which makes sense because it's strongly coupled. But you can actually say something interesting about it using anomaly inflow. So this is the picture I had before with the torus and the r brain in there. And I'm now going to deform it just for illustration purposes. This is like a disc. You can deform a disc to a very long cigar. So I'm just you know, tilting it sideways and making it long. And why am I doing this? Well, if I look at it, if, if I go away, then, then now I go away from the r brain and I just look here. This just looks like type 2b on a circle with a holonomy of minus 1 to the FL. That is a supersymmetric theory that people have studied. It's called the uh, AOB background. Uh, and it's something you can study just with supergravity. And one thing that you can do, I don't think it was in the literature, but it's not difficult to do. You can compute that there's a one loop turn Simon's term because fermions run on the circle generate a one loop turn Simon's term, which looks like this. Okay? It's just a combination of the U1, Galusa Klein U1, and uh, gravitational classes with some random looking coefficient, OK? Uh, now, whenever you have, uh, this is like the, the story with, with, uh, with topological theories and anomalies, the story of anomaly inflow. If you have a topological term in here and you want to put a boundary, it better be that this topological theory is actually the anomaly theory of whatever you have there. And this is where things could have gone wrong. It turns out that this thing I gave you is actually the anomaly polynomial of one direct fermion of R charge one half. It's a bit frustrating because for some, for, for some details, we cannot really argue that we must have a Goldstino here for this brain, brain that breaks Susie. But if we had a Goldstino, it would be like this. Uh, and the fact that the coefficients come out correctly quantized is non-trivial. When you do the churn simons terms, you need to take into account the self-dual field, the gravitino, the dilatino. Each of them have crazy coefficients. They add up correctly. So that's a little check of the coordination conjecture. Could be that the coordination conjecture was wrong. This background has no boundary. And then this would have not come out correctly quantized. The fun thing, the, the, re, the, the really thing, the most interesting thing uh, about, the, about the R7 brain is that it acts as an it's, it's that it acts as analysis string for D3 brains. Meaning, if you take a D3 brain, and if you take it around the R7 brain, it comes back as an anti-D3. Ibu, yes? Sorry, the, good. So the, um, I shouldn't call it, shouldn't not have called it R-charge. I just meant the, 
the U1 of the cigar, okay? It, it's, it's, it's not an R charge, but it's the, if the, uh, in, okay. So if the brain had been supersymmetric, okay, then they would have had a U1R symmetry. And in all the other examples, that's, that the U1 is the R charge, that we were calling it R charge. So, you know, you, it gets back to an anti D3 brain simply because the C4 flips under the action of the symmetry that this is thing is a defect for. And what that means, um, well, uh, what, what that means is that you can take an anti D3, try to lasso it around the R7 brain. Uh, okay, so what, what that means, whenever you have a situation where you have a brain that becomes an anti brain, there has to be more volume fields on the object you have here that allow you to induce the charge of the anti-D3 brain, simply because otherwise I would have violated the D3 brain charge, okay? So there has to be some field that allows you to induce D3 brain charge in the word volume. And we have examples of this. This happens with literally every D brain, right? Well, we argue that for the R7 brain, you cannot do it in exactly the same way as for a, for a, for a, for a D brain. For a D brain, you have terms which are like C4, times trace of F squared, okay? But trace of F squared is something which is always uh, even under any Z2 action. Because if I take, you know, when, when I take, when, the, when, when, I act, when I ask how does the, the symmetry, the, the minus one to the FN symmetry act on the, on the word volume fields, uh, it can act with either plus one or minus one. And in both cases, trace of F squared doesn't flip sign. And here I need something that flips sign because C4 flips sign. I need something which is like that, and I need something which integrates to something non-zero, even on a sphere, okay? And so the only, this is not a theorem, but the, really the one thing that we could think of that has all these properties is a massless three-form field. So we believe there's a massless three-form field on the R7 brain that couples to the different range charge. This also shows in a massive way that, in a very clear way that this is not supersymmetric because there's just no multiplet that could do this. Uh, so just to finish, let me now go to the last row. I'm, I'm doing the easy rows. Mark is going to do the more interesting rows. Uh, so I'm going to go to omega 10. So cobordism, in, cobordism groups can also be used to classify topological field theories. So the group omega 10 detects, it's telling you which possible discrete data angles could you turn on in time to be supergravity in 10 dimensions. Type 2B supergravity is uniquely fixed by supersymmetry, but you could add discrete couplings. And we don't know which, which ones could you add and whether they are actually there or not. We have the same problem in M-theory. For type 2B, we, you know, we analyze this problem within the context, but we basically were demanding, we wanna have discrete data angles that are okay with duality. And you know, I could give you detailed expressions, but instead of that, I chose to give you like four manifolds on which the corresponding theta angles give you non-zero value. So they detect these four manifolds. And so it looks like there's four theta angles, there's like potentially, you know, two to the four different versions of type 2B. Well, things are actually better. We were able to kill some of those uh, by using T-duality. So for instance, one of the theta angles takes values in the quaternary projected plane times T2. You can make one of the size of the T2 very small, you can T-dualize. And this becomes HP2 times T2 on type 2A. The cover design groups of type 2A or M theory were computed by these two smart people. And they, 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 they assure us, don't push me on details, but they assure us that this thing is trivial in Bordism. So if T duality is a good symmetry, we can pull that back somehow to type 2B and see that this is also not, uh, uh, it's, 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 there's not discrete angle that can detect this. There's also another guy like that where we can make the same argument. And there is, there's one, that are, uh, one, one angle where it's not so obvious how to make it, but I think it's probably done. And then there's finally one class in which it's actually t dualizes to another class which has a theta angle in M theory for which we don't know if it's there or not. So there's a conservation. It could have been that you could have used this argument to kill it, you know, because if you could argue this is trivial in Bordism here, but it's not the case. Okay. So, yes. 
Well, right. So it doesn't. So the, it doesn't preserve the the supergravity coordination groups. That's true. But what, what what I'm arguing here is whether there is a, some kind of way in the full string theory to exhibit this is a boundary, and then I'm allowed to do t duality. This is like I'm 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 just viewing this as an allowed coordination in omega quantum gravity. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just having I just have this guy. Okay. And as I try to make a boundary for it, I'm just going to make the circle small. And then I'm just going to go, oh, no, actually, this is type 2A. And then I'm going to decover this in there. So I'm just going to plumb the two things together. That gives me a coverdism. It is, you're completely right. It's not a coverdism in type 2B. Of course not. Oh, in type 2B supergravity. And indeed, you know, it gives you speed winding mode. I'm just giving you an argument that the stringy defects that I was predicting in the other cases, OK? They exist in this case explicitly, and so it can be argued to you can use them to argue that the theta angle vanishes. Yes? I mean, presumably you could also take whatever matter to realize that you have to find the defects. I don't know. Yes, yes, it, but it's it, well, that's what I'm doing with the plumbing. The only thing I'm, I think this is where Ivo's question was going to is that the, the cover descent groups of the type to be super gravity, those they think there's a theta angle, they are wrong. And it's you're getting defects in string theory or in quantum gravity, and yeah, but you could of course then then in the end you constructed a stringy defect in type two B string theory, as Jake said. No, no, no. But this is no, no. But this is this. You know, this is this just requires me doing duality. It's something we believe is good in type two B string theory or type two string theories. I mean, I I I, I choose to believe in duality. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I just, I, I mean, a bot manifold. I mean, any manifold has a direct index of one. But spin seven is an example. And I thought for this audience it would be like nicer to say spin seven. But yeah, it's, it's really topological. I don't care about the metric here. Good. So just to conclude, we've completed some cover and groups of type 2B. They lead to some interesting brains and clarify some questions regarding data angles. And, you know, there's many, many more stuff to be uncovered after the coffee break in Marcus's talk. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll stop here and I hope to convince you this is interesting and you join us in further voyages into the lands of Tuborde. Thank you. Thank you very much for the next talk. I, I hope that the people that are probably too big and naive questions that you probably answered in some form or another. But uh, the first question is um, is so is, is part of the, uh, the takeaway here uh, that there at the moment isn't a way to understand, uh, for example, like the charges on these defects run into using the coordinates? Uh, the, like the, 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 the charges that live on the brains on the defects that we are predicting with coordinates and conjecture? Well, but how do you know this is non susi So, how do you know it has a gauge field to begin with? Right? So, uh, oh, so, oh, so you mean for the susi brains, can we understand the, the uh, can, can we be more precise? Can we understand something about, right? Could you do something like the anomaly inflow that I did for a SUSI brain and recover something like the anomaly polynomial of the of the of the type to be? Uh, yes, in principle. Funnily enough, the details are more complicated than for this one. And so there's the answer is yes, but there's some terms that you cannot get from this picture. If you choose them right, then you match. Uh, but in principle, yes. And the, 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 there's, I think, very powerful combination of coverdism with anomaly inflow. You first predict the defect. You try to understand if the anomaly is lead you to a world volume three that makes sense. And conversely, it's very, very difficult to say anything about the world volume of these guys without other, other than doing anomalies. In fact, I didn't mention, but I don't even know. We don't even know whether this R7 brain, what does it do, what does it do dynamically? Maybe it likes to explode. Maybe it likes to, to pattern out. We don't know. I don't know. Very good. So the picture in, for instance, in Jagan Kumru's paper is that this is like an it's like a staircase. I first think I'm in type to be, you know, or type to be Sporgavan Kalabi Yao. 
and I just, I'm just going to do smooth stuff, okay? And then there's many cooperatism classes. And then maybe because I learn about conifolds uh, or because I, I want to trivialize some of the cooperatism classes, I say, oh, these defects that are conifolds exist there. And, but then you get to play the game again. You say, oh, now I have a new theory, which is type 2B with conifolds. And you know, now there's many things that are trivial, but maybe you can twist the conifolds in a complicated way. So there's something new, which is not in cooperatism. Then you can replay the game. What is the stuff that I need to add to trivialize these other defects? Case in point, type 2B supergravity, we kind of understand the cooperatism groups. Throw in orientifolds, they haven't been computed. So, yeah, you could view them as topology in transitions, or uh, you could, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you could, yeah. So, uh, so there are these modesty generators that we are familiar with. Have you tried to see what the new version of it, right? So, that you see, are there any other interesting works and uh, creations coming from other dualities? Uh, from other dualities. Yeah, so you're asking, for instance, like we compactify, then we have like bigger duality groups, stuff like that, for instance. This is a very interesting question. We haven't done it. There's, there's a lot more to get from these guys, and you will see Marcus' stuff. So, the forest running terrain, those terrains will be recharged. Yes. It, it, you, it has to be twisted. Okay, so what is the twist? Thing? Yes, with the so if I'm understanding Jack exactly correctly, is the minus the bundles are minus minus one to the FL equivariant, like the story when you have orientifolds. It's not using the orientifolds using the and the Maybe you you look at tachyon bundles on an orientifold or something. Maybe you get them. Maybe. So D and T T9 just by themselves are not gonna get this guy because you need to somehow impose that the thing is like minus one to the FL equivariant. So the way that happens in examples is you pick like the K theory story on an oriented pole or something like that. Maybe thinking that way you can get them, but certainly not in the 10 device. What's the special of what, what, sir? So you didn't choose the EDs example, which look like the state dimensions. So these, the, the e, 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 six dimensions for the cover systems? <laughs> Good. I love this question because the, when we were writing the draft, like the, this question, I think Jonathan brought up this question. I was like, why does this? This guy vanishes, and we're like, I don't know. Like sometimes cover system groups vanish, and there's usually interesting physics behind that. For instance, if I was just doing omega three spin, um, that one vanishes, and that is actually sometimes, for instance, like the that means that, for instance, if I give you a T three with pre-boundary conditions, there's a boundary for that. The boundary for that is half a K three. It's not something easy. Maybe something like this is playing here. Uh, we did think a little bit about it. We didn't have a, a good answer. The, the, the interesting thing here is that everything you have, a, you know, you 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 do. Like, I don't know. You do a calabilla with some whatever bundle. Okay, the spin bordism group here also vanishes, which also helps. And that one I can understand better. Think of a calabilla. Calabilla has SYC vibration, so there's a T3, and I told you the T3 is trivial. So maybe I can fiber. You need to work. I mean, that, these are words, like, but, but maybe it works. It makes intuitive sense. And here, somehow, I'm telling you with the additional bundle is not changing much. But I don't know. Just a comment on the earlier question about blocks and stuff like that. So, do you imagine that Gordon already includes some call of things like blocks and like multiple conditions? Um, because the Gordon is said that the Euclidean you know, method in you know, three dimension plus one is smooth, but if you start like the act, it finds the other one. And so, the Gordon includes any call of things called the other Yeah, it's like the curve board is on the pad, and it's like the curve point. 
we'll get to universe size. So it's supposed to be a sublimit to be done. Sorry, I'm saying that that the borders on the evolving jumps to the manifolds are in the evolving data that might be a bit simpler. Okay. Like in your picture in the slides yesterday, where there were the two circles were doing like poop, right? Yeah. yeah. I agree also, it's not exactly the same as having them as the base manifolds, but 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 I think yeah, yeah, it's completely. So yeah, so omega ten um for this group that'll be about today into um but that's about well, sometimes, well, okay, so we, we had like the, um, I, I said I talked about the, you know, the last example, right, you see the 11 here, that's a story about anomalies of type 2b that we did earlier with Marcus, Jonathan, and Arun. Uh, so that one, for instance, we basically found that an anomaly in the duality group of type 2b. There are several ways to cancel it. I think Marcus is going to talk about this. One of the one of the ways involves uh, uh, adding a new non-invertible TKFT uh, in in ten dimensions. But that's the ugly guy. We don't like that one. But there's there's probably a better way. So sometimes, you know, you, if you, if you have anomalies, that, that's my answer. Sorry, I should have just said anomalies. But sometimes, sometimes you can introduce non-invertible TKFTs to cancel an anomaly. Sometimes, but there's also like non-invertible TKFTs that don't have an anomaly, and those I have no good answer. Why, why, why couldn't I? Uh, 